Thank you everybody for joining for this third day of, of the courses. And this week was the, the time for the Ports and Waterways courses between the cooperation of TU Delft and the Faculty of Engineering within the University of Buenos Aires, especially with the Postgraduate School of Port Engineering, uh, that it has more than, than 60 years of experience uh, and development in, in our country and in South America in general. So today our speaker uh, is Fedor Vart. Uh, he's a senior researcher uh, within Deltares, uh, the main laboratory of hydraulics in, in the Netherlands, and at worldwide level, one of the key laboratories. And he's also working uh, within the, the Department of Ports and Waterways at TUF. So it's a pleasure for us to, to have you here, Fedor. Uh, so thank you uh, again for joining. Uh, and well, I, I give you the floor to you. So uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pablo, for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Um, oh, um, hey, let me just share my screen. I prepared a, I think, a really nice uh, um, lecture for you. I uh, prepared an, uh, a presentation about uh, some work that we are working on uh, um, in a collaboration between the TU Delft and um, uh, Deltares on the digital twin of waterways. It's actually in, um, in Europe, it's a bit of a um, popular uh, concept that uh, digital twins, I'll explain that a bit uh, uh, later. Uh, first, a bit about myself, I'm uh, Feder Bart. I work at uh, uh, Deltares and the TU Delft, uh, like you said, two days a week at the Ports and Waterways Group and uh, three days a week at Deltares. And there I work on uh, so-called enabling um, uh, technologies on the topics of data science and future modeling. So I work on a lot of the computer models at uh, Deltares and um, in the university I also work on these topics, but then specific uh, to the uh, topic of ports and waterways. And uh, I prepared a few, uh, showed a few examples of typical research uh, that I did. So I got a PhD in coastal uh, engineering on confidence in coastal forecasts. That's in uh, Delft. I also got a... Um, I work on a lot of uh, uh, different topics, but always on the focus on uh, data science and uh, future modeling. For example, there I'm... Uh, in the middle on the top there, I'm reconstructing, um, um, a uh, trying to find where uh, debris from a lost plane came from, from the MH370. So I've, uh, that's where we use um, uh, my particle model uh, simulations. Um, on the right on the top there, I'm uh, escaping from uh, Alcatraz. That was my uh, 15 minutes of fame uh, in, um, in the US when I um, simulated um, uh, how people could have escaped in 1962 from the Alcatraz Island that you see there in the background, and it became quite a um, popular topic. So I made some documentaries about that. On the bottom left, you see uh, one island I actually discovered. It was the Grape Island in uh, in China. So they actually made um, a copy of our uh, island that we created in Dubai, and they. And um, I was actually the first one to uh, uh, notice that through our satellite um, scanning of new land and new water, which I'll also come back to uh, later. Also work on sea level rise uh, research at Altars. And um, I try to work on um, uh, some visualizations, as you can see on the bottom right. Okay, so, so that's a first uh, overview of uh, myself. Um, and so I prepared today's lecture in three uh, topics uh, or four um, uh, parts. First, uh, three, uh, let's say, general uh, topics, a bit more general. And then a bit after the, we have a short break, I want to uh, go in a bit more detail on the concept of digital twin of the waterways that we're working on together with uh, Deltares and um, TU Delft. And so I'll go in a bit more detail on that uh, topic. But first, some uh, let's say general challenges that we are uh, working on. Uh, um, uh, so, in the ports and waterways group, 
And we're trying to work on um, both local and um, uh, more global problems. Uh, for example, this week I was um, uh, sitting with uh, Dell, one of the computer companies where I was working on, um, I got like a big computer cluster from them uh, that they lent me uh, so that I could do uh, big simulations, but they were a bit worried because they had a big uh, chip shortage. And if you look at it, uh, this was partly due to the pandemic, but it was also partly due to the, um, uh, let's say the queuing that happened um, in uh, the Suez Canal. And um, if you look at that, uh, then you can, we can now actually uh, zoom into that uh, the problem and look back in history. So I made, if you look at the link that I, uh, I'll share the presentation later. I made a nice uh, comparison of how a normal day in the Suez Canal looks like. Yeah, so you see a few ships here, but if you look, use the latest uh, optical satellite images, you can actually see that in March of this year, there was not just a few ships wait, waiting, but the whole uh, basin was actually filled with uh, ships. And that was, if we zoom in a bit further, yeah, you can see here on the uh, top uh, right that uh, one of the evergreen uh, uh, ships was um, yeah, got stuck there. And uh, here you see the IES data from uh, Vessel Finder uh, that showed that same picture of um, ships waiting for them uh, um, for uh, to be able to sail through the Suez Canal again. And that actually caused quite a bit of uh, ripple through the whole logistic world, as you uh, probably know. And, but it's also a really interesting um, head topic if you look at it from how we simulate ports, yeah, because it's a very um, interesting problem that you really see uh, literally a queue building up uh, that is normally not there and that you see how, um, how big of an impact actually and how much we're dependent on a smooth, um, a smooth transport network. And that's actually uh, also a really interesting research topic to make a good reconstruction of what actually happened. And you can look at that in very, uh, let's say, highly detail uh, to look how it got stuck. But you can also zoom out to see how it impacted the whole world and how that caused uh, Dell yesterday to uh, complained to me about how they had now had 70 days of waiting time for a, for a processor. And that it, now they had a big problem selling and, and getting computers ready to do our simulations. And so that's, I think, really interesting times uh, also, and really big problems that uh, impact the, the whole world. And you also see it in uh, discussions here. Of course, it's not only uh, the, as Suez Canal, but also the asynchronous unavailability of China and Europe, for example, uh, due to the pandemic. But uh, let's say that it didn't help. Another example of a real big challenge that we're working on is, uh, is from the EU, the so-called uh, Green Deal, uh, where they both ask us, um, or let's say ask Europe and the transport network to uh, both at the same time reduce emissions, but also to move um, uh, move more traffic to the shipping um, uh, modality. And then uh, given that that's an almost unsolvable issue because we don't have, um, let's say enough power and enough hydrogen or other green sources of energy at the moment. And so that transition to this uh, green energy uh, where ships will play a very big uh, uh, role in uh, inland shipping uh, is a real big, um, big challenge also uh, because for example, our waterways are becoming more sensitive to uh, with bigger ships are more sensitive to climate uh, change. And that, um, yeah, that's an interesting challenge. And those are some uh, big examples here. You see, um, this is actually a picture from um, uh, a few weeks ago that we had our first electric ship. It doesn't look that fancy, but it's actually one of the a technical step forward that we made this first electrical ship sail through our inland uh, channels. I think we already had a few uh, hydrogen and a lot already um, switched from um, uh, diesel to uh, gas, but this was, um, I think, announced last week. And it works that uh, one of the containers is, uh, is a battery. And that uh, the idea is that you then uh, replace that 
um, at the shore yeah, at one of the and that is a challenge yeah, where where should we place those uh, battery packs and where should be the uh, hydrogen terminals be placed had yeah, that logistic challenge combined with um, port design challenge yeah, is a real big yeah, all these questions are let's say unsolved yeah? so there's a lot of um, uh, challenges uh, challenges out there it also reminded me a bit of the i think i found a nice video of where they use the same idea actually for tesla and uh, that was uh, uh, accepted quite uh, enthusiastically by the uh, journalists that are in this uh, room and this was one of the first uh, teslas that had the same concept of also replacing the battery and uh, in the back, you see uh, Elon Musk, and he was really happy. He turned on some nice uh, music. I'll just uh, lower the volume a bit. Yeah, but they, uh, in the background, they're uh, screaming and making nice videos. And if we zoom forward a bit, and normally you have to wait 40 minutes to charge your uh, Tesla, if you're allowed to hook on to what was, uh, one of these uh, speed chargers. Yeah, but now the idea was that you could just uh, replace your uh, battery. And here, if we scroll, it also takes a bit of time. And then the battery pack is taken out, and then a new battery pack is placed in. And uh, uh, it also changes color somehow. Was it white earlier? No. Anyway, yeah, so that is uh, yeah, that concept was also applied to Tesla. But actually, I was wondering how it now uh, was going with that. And I actually found someone who went to one of these stations where you could replace your battery pack. And um, let's. Uh, See how that happened. See, this is one of these battery swap places. And here you have a Tesla owner who's trying to go in. And so what you actually see is that it's uh, uh, hooked up to the power. And you see a cable there. And so that idea actually didn't fly, at least not with the Tesla. And so this is now closed, so you can't go in. And you see, you see it's connected to the cable. Because the problem was that everybody with a good battery uh, didn't go there. And everyone with a bad battery dropped their battery off there. So at, uh, after a while, you only had bad batteries. Uh, uh, and so nobody wanted to pick those up uh, anymore. Anyway, that's um, interesting to see how that uh, transition will go. And uh, I'm sure there will be quite a few um, option changes uh, along the path. But that's, um, I think it's a really um, interesting um, uh, path. And also, uh, that's also in our uh, ports and waterways group where we are uh, focusing on. Um, uh, Mark also explained a bit about this, uh, that we're trying to and let's say also in this uh, Tesla example, eh, you need to zoom all the way into the uh, real problem on a single car, but you also need to be able to zoom. Eh, you have ambitions on the whole uh, country or uh, even the whole continent uh, level, if you look at uh, Europe. And then you need to make sure that the details are, uh, let's say, solved, but you also eh, it also needs to be solved if you zoom out. That's also where um, uh, Solange, PhD, uh, that I guide together with Mark is working on and trying to uh, really get that zooming in, uh, in and out, uh, both in uh, time and in space, uh, to really uh, make sure that uh, that, that connects uh, well. And um, and it's also one of my uh, interests. And also, uh, Mark, uh, I think explained a bit uh, that if you look at the uh, ports, uh, if you zoom out, you have multiple ports with multiple modalities. Uh, but then if you zoom in, uh, then you have a single sluice or a single lock and uh, a single uh, uh, harbor that also needs to get all the details uh, correct. And that's, uh, that's, I think, uh, one of the really interesting challenges is that many uh, in ports and waterways, that a lot of people, uh, that it's really important, uh, so it affects everybody. And um, it also has a lot of these very interesting uh, challenges. And of course, if you look, I'm also explaining a bit about uh, digital twins and simulations. And then we also have a lot of techniques that help 
uh, with that zooming in and out. Eh? So for example, on the left here, um, yeah, you have a lot of numerical modeling methods that help to make sure that we can actually zoom in and out. Eh? For example, you can nest models, you can do adaptive mesh refinements in the uh, locations that you're interested in, or you can use so-called uh, subgrid or tiling methods. Or even more advanced is to during the simulation, yeah, for example, here, if you imagine the adaptive mesh refinement yeah, to be some um, uh, oil uh, spill, for example, then if there's nothing, then you only want to compute, yeah, then you don't want to compute anything. But you, if there's a local, uh, yeah, as the oil changes its path, yeah, you might want to do more detailed uh, computation at certain uh, regions. And even more advanced are these uh, so-called mesh-free methods, where you don't even have that um, confinement of a mesh anymore that you have to predefine. And also on the right, more data-driven methods where you use uh, interpolation techniques, advanced, uh, for example, to interpolate along a shoreline, for example, or, or statistical downscaling or so-called upresing, uh, more neural network-based approaches that, uh, that you can use to uh, provide detail uh, when you need it. Uh, so the, and those advancements are some of the topics that I really like uh, working on. And we also apply it um, across the world. For example, we are scanning, like I um, said, we're scanning the whole world for new land and water. And then you sometimes find really interesting new images. Hey, here you see a fish farm, for example, that shows up when you um, zoom into certain parts of the coast. And we also did a real um, big analysis that was. Uh, one of the first analysis that we um, uh, did where we used petabytes of data, we did it together with uh, Google to uh, scan all the shorelines in the world. And this is uh, what we did with Arjen Leijendijk. And then uh, what we did is basically try to see um, if a satellite sees a certain part of the coast, yeah, how is the wave spectrum? You can then transform that into um, a so-called water index. Yeah, they just basically separate land and water. And then um, if you then filter that, then you can derive the shoreline. And if and the challenge is then to scale up such an algorithm so that it can work on all the satellite information that we have. So we now have about two petabytes of uh, optical satellite information uh, starting from the 90s. And we re uh, we did the reanalysis of all this data to see all the shorelines changes in the world. And we're mainly interested in shoreline changes where there are sandy coasts. And so then um, and this is one of the techniques we use to detect sand from um, non-sandy coasts. Then we actually started training with our own island Tessel. And that was actually quite uh, that was actually quite representative for many coasts around the world. We added a few more, and then we could see sand all over the world to see where it's distributed. Eh? And then both on a zoomed out level, so you can see, for example, here the uh, vertical distribution of sand, and then you also see that it's not, eh, let's say, equally distributed. Not everybody gets the same amount. And uh, so we have quite a lot in the Netherlands. So that's why we also use it to build such uh, nourishments. But uh, for example, if you look here near the Singapore, then you see that they have a much bigger challenge to keep their uh, shores uh, in line. But this concept uh, um, to be able to um, uh, scale up such algorithms so that it's both, uh, let's say this is on a 100 meter resolution and you have, what is it, 2 million Depends, of course, on the scale that you look at, but uh, two million kilometers of uh, a coastline. And then um, to be able to scale that up, such a computation, I really find that interesting. And also, if you uh, have um, interest to do research on that, they always feel free to uh, contact me to see if we can work on these uh, topics uh, together. And so we were now able to, even at places that we've never been to, give a good estimate of um, erosion rates, for example. That was that uh, research with uh, Arjen. And that's also uh, what, uh, what we call, uh, let's say, a global first approach that you don't, uh, let's say, do the research only on your own uh, coastline or your own port, but try to um, uh, scale it up so that it works for the whole world but still have the local uh, 
uh, relevance. Hey, like we still be able to use also the local data sets and to be able to provide the local detail that you actually need. Yeah, so and that's, um, yeah, that's what we call the global first approach. And that, um, and that at least helps us also to have a quite a big uh, impact um, so that we can say things uh, everywhere around the world. Yeah, so and, yeah, but it, of course, yeah, that needs quite a lot of data. Yeah, so uh, in some locations, you have a huge data set. So for example, this is one simple harbor near uh, Scheveningen in the Netherlands. And that yeah, this is a point cloud of, um, of a few terabytes. Uh, and yeah, then you can see the coastline and the growings in all its uh, uh, details in uh, several points per um, square meters. And then you can really view all the details in 3D. Uh, but of course, hey, uh, if you look over the whole world, hey, you have a lot of variety, variety in how much data you have available. That's also where it's a launch and I um, are working on that you have algorithms that can work with small, uh, let's say little data, little availability of data. But if you have more data, this you also use that. Uh, uh, so that uh, you can do it as good as possible. And we call that the mosaicing, uh, that you have a core solution everywhere. And if you have a more detailed solution that you put it on top and then overlay that so that you have the most detailed solution um, if it's available. But if not, you still have global coverage. Any questions so far? I think for the moment, uh, we, we didn't receive any question further. Okay. Perhaps yes. only okay. a comment that, that came to, to my mind when, when you were yeah. mentioning about the Tesla and the, and the inland barge with, with the battery change. Uh, yeah. Also came to my mind the automated guided vehicles that you can find an APMT uh, within Mass Flag de Tue, uh, at yeah. the port of Rotterdam, that they change the batteries. Uh, uh, and replace oh, yeah. the batteries uh, over there. Just it was only recalling me to to that oh, example yeah. on, on the terminal itself. Oh yeah, they have that already. Or I, I don't know. Yeah, they have already oh, since yeah. 2014. Is already functioning that the oh, yeah. AGVs uh, go directly to change their batteries, but still oh, yeah. a human needs to do the change of the battery within their oh, yeah. warehouse. And they leave the other ones richer. There, recharge, they don't have that. a pile of uh, old, uh, uh, old batteries. No, they, they, they have managed their own stock. Oh, yeah. And, and, but it's also a bit with the, the uh, Tesla eh, that it's, eh, let's say, on the threshold of a uh, comfortable uh, level eh, that people get uh, what's called uh, anxiety, uh, um, you know, for range anxiety, eh, that they're. I'm not sure if they will reach their next uh, stop or uh, holiday yeah. destination, for example, these days. But uh, like uh, these cheaper electric cars, uh, and for example, we have uh, Deltaars electric car. And then I'm, uh, let's say I can't, even though we have a small country, I can't reach it all without uh, having to... Um, charge up but it's uh, i think uh, my main point was that it's a really interesting mm -hmm. time uh, that you see these uh, very ideas coming up really enthusiastic uh, uh, perceived but then uh, a detail was forgotten and that yeah, is yeah. Uh, i think where and uh, where we have to do some engineering to make sure that also the details are uh, uh, right uh, and here another yeah. data set of the a uh, border between uh, Korea and China it's, um, it's actually one of the, um, I made some um, video maps a few years ago where you could zoom in all the way into details um, uh, based on historical satellite images. And this was one of the interesting areas that I uh, found where I was really surprised to find this really straight uh, uh, border. Anybody has any idea what this could be? Yeah, so these are nighttime satellite images, yeah, so lights. And here on the, on the ocean between uh, China and uh, uh, Korea, uh, you see, yeah, let's say this border back in a really sharp line. Anybody know what this could be? Fishing boats, fishing vessels. Yeah, so they, they actually fish for uh, squid, I think it is. 
Yeah, those come mm. uh, are sensitive to light, if I understood it correctly. And uh, but they're not allowed to go further. There are actually some shippers were arrested when they crossed this line. And uh, yeah, but that is the most uh, a place where you can find uh, the most uh, fish. And so they actually sail all the way up to the um, uh, up to the border and then turn on their lights. And then you see, uh, if you look at night from the sky, you see these uh, ships uh, uh, lining up. Hey? Like this is a long time exposure. Hey? So this is not from one night, but if you combine a lot of nights uh, after each other, and then you see this sharp line up here. And that's what I really find interesting hey, that you um, really explore the, the whole world to see hey, what people are doing exactly. Yeah. Feather, that, uh, a small yeah. comment from from my side. It, it, yeah. It's it, it's a tricky question uh, and a tricky answer from myself because if you explore the Argentine Sea here in front of the, yeah. the coast of Argentina, in the mile yeah. 200, 201, you have the same situation. Argentina no. has the only fleet for the squids for fishing squids yeah. uh, in the whole Western Hemisphere. And oh, yeah. all the vessels are coming from from China, uh, Taiwan, okay. Japan, uh, to fish on our mile 200. So we see that quite frequently on the news, or at least oh, yeah. all of us that we are looking for this news. Because of that, the the, the, the answer. But just to to, to share with oh, you yeah. some some it's feedback it, as well. Have a look. Uh, I think I still have that website uh, online, so I might have a look. Um... Uh, later uh, to see if we can also see that. Uh. Okay. And this is another example of uh, data sets that you could use, uh, even if you don't have uh, that fears is an example of a data set that's typically used for to track certain uh, shipping, uh, uh, fishing boats, I mean, but, uh, uh, and also uh, we use it, for example, to uh, track conflicts about water on land. Yeah, so, uh, for example, if you look at um, uh, if there's a new uh, dam being built, what we do is look at how that affects people. And then you actually see people, yeah, if you see uh, light as a proxy for people, they actually see these people moving around after a new dam is built because there's more water uh, somewhere else. And then uh, you see people following the water. It's actually quite, uh, we, we do that for our Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, it is another uh, data set, also sort of time exposure of the so-called uh, Sentinel-1 that also has a global coverage. And here you see the Rotterdam Harbor. Yeah, so even if you don't have, for example, IES uh, measurements, which I'll uh, uh, also discuss in a minute, hey, you still see, for example, all the shipping lanes. And here you see the, all the anchorage areas uh, near the Rotterdam Harbor, here you see the waiting area for, um, um, how do you call it, uh, the, the guiding uh, ships that guide bigger ships into the uh, port. And uh, here you I see know. these big reflections are the, uh, the uh, um, um, I think these panels on a certain, um, how do you call it, this, um, um, wind farms that uh, that are very reflective and uh, actually screw up a bit the the radar uh, images okay, but that's um, so that is really interesting that uh, even in data scarce environments these days you can still learn a lot uh, by looking at these publicly available uh, data sets of course you also need a bit of context eh? for example these are yeah, this is how busy now the, uh, the North Sea uh, is when you look at it. Yeah, so yeah, we're, I'll come back to it in a, mate, uh, a bit later. But then yeah, you also need a lot of information. Is there, uh, for example, these purple areas are where the military is active. Uh, here there's uh, certain uh, archaeological sites. If you, I'm not sure. Can you see my mouse if I move? If I point to something. Yes, yes, we can. We can. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. And then um, hey, here are these uh, shipping lanes, for example, and uh, somehow we uh, paid, um, paid uh, companies for cable crossings more than, uh, yeah, so our cable network is a bit like if you hire an uh, uh, electrical engineer from hell to build your uh, 
uh, electro coho wiring. So that's now a bit uh, messy. Yeah, so that's also a challenge. And uh, of course, we need like sand nourishment area. So I'll come back to that. Yeah, but that, uh, uh, what I meant here is more that that's also spatial information that you need yeah, to have a context of uh, what you're looking at. Yeah? And uh, there, for example, you can now, yeah, what we typically use is uh, OpenStreetMap. Yeah? So this is the Buenos Aires terminal, for example. And then somehow someone filled in uh, where the cranes are. I'm not sure how accurate uh, that is, yeah? but that's even without um, visiting uh, now, uh, we can still already uh, start to collect information um, also in the port of Buenos Aires and um, start to set up, for example, a first uh, model and uh, do analysis of uh, and what is going on where in the world. Uh, so that is really a nice advancement. Uh, you can also in some EU projects we worked on, so that you can really query that information yeah, so you have this uh, systems called, uh, I didn't work on this, but uh, the EU um, projects um, developed this an uh, overpass turbo website where you can query, for example, this um, open street map information. And if you, uh, for example, uh, search for lock gates, waterway is lock gates, I think get all these uh, locks here. And those are not always, as ever. I looked, for example, in Argentina, uh, not all that information is filled in so much detail as it is in uh, uh, the Netherlands, for example. But that, um, yeah, what we typically do is try to also um, uh, fill in that information in this place, in OpenStreetMap, because then everybody benefits from it. And then, um, yeah, so uh, we also uh, give courses, for example, or do um, um, uh, sessions with students so that if you want to build, for example, a model of locks, say, like Floor, for example, from our group is now building these locks, and then it would be a logical step to uh, first determine where these locks are and then fill them in here in that system and then build your model up from that. And what you can also do, for example, uh, what we now do with DEMS uh, for, for uh, Google is we're scanning the whole world for DEMS, for example. And then we use OpenStreetMap to find known DEMS. And then if it looks like a DEM and it uh, has water around it and it uh, looks similar in other, it is a sort of straight line, then we use a neural network image to also detect uh, DEMS in other places around the world. And that's also something you could use to be able to get coverage of things that are not yet mapped. So not the whole world is mapped, not all the data is publicly available. And so this is an example how you can even generate uh, a data set, even if it's not um, um, available yet. Um, yeah, I also wanted to show that we also um, um, set up um, 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 IES data set for the Netherlands together with uh, Rijkswaterstaat and with uh, Microsoft. I was working on that with uh, Solange. And um, uh, we made a nice website out of it. So it's in Dutch, but I'll uh, uh, guide you through it. I think I have that in the other top. And, um, and so this is uh, a data set that um, and so IES data, you probably, most of you know it, but it's a signal that the ship sends out uh, while it's uh, sailing and uh, you can uh, receive that. Uh, like if you have a, a radio receiver, you can receive those messages and they can track the shipping uh, traffic uh, as it's happening. You can also store that. Uh, so if you store all these messages, you get a data set of what happens uh, where in the world, eh? so and for specifically for the Netherlands, eh, we have a whole collection of several years, and then it becomes quite big. Eh? So this is in the order of uh, tens of uh, terabytes, and then it's a bit uncomfortable to work with because uh, it doesn't fit on your computer anymore. And together with Microsoft, uh, with their new planetary computer. Um, we actually worked to um, uh, to be able to use that data for research without uh, having to wait for results too long. And uh, uh, to showcase this, we made a nice uh, map of uh, um, what I explained earlier, that it's now a bit busy on the North Sea. And so there's not much space uh, to do everything anymore. And we made a nice uh, story out of this, uh, Solange and I. 
and a few others. So if we scroll through this, and then we have here the Dutch coast. And one of the issues is that we have a lot of challenges like energy. So here we are building a lot of wind farms. Here we have places that we have reserved for wind farms. And some have already been built and some are in, uh, in progress. But we also have places for sand. And so these are all the locations that we know that there's good sand. And because we are uh, well uh, below sea level, but there's um, some concerns of imminent sea level rise. Uh, but we, uh, um, and so at least at the moment, we're nourishing our coast. And so for every centimeter of sea level rise, we put uh, 12 million uh, cubic uh, meters of sand on our coast and we get it from here. And then we put it, uh, uh, at least that's what we started with now, uh, put it down here and then we let the uh, tide uh, uh, take it along the coast. And sometimes when there's um, some concerns about a certain location, we put it at specific places here along the coast. And so, but that's, that's, um, it's not good to build something here because at least then, but during the duration of so that, that's there, it's harder to get the sand out. And we also have these cables uh, that I mentioned, electricity and uh, internet, uh, gas, and um, um, we're now building CO2 um, pipelines also. And um, these are the shipping lanes, which are already reserved. Yeah, so that's also uh, hard to do something else um, in the shipping lane. And so that makes it quite, a, let's say, a busy picture. Yeah, so, and then, yeah, uh, but we also have big plans yeah, to store CO2, like I mentioned, or have uh, floating islands or floating um, solar uh, panels. Um, yeah, and um, some people want to build uh, a flower here. A tulip, yeah, and uh, but it's hard to find a good spot, yeah, so that's a lot of spatial planning uh, issues. And so what we did is to map all the IS uh, messages that we've received so far, and then to be able to see in detail what's actually going on to also give a feeling of how busy it is, and not by just by showing this is a sign, but also to really show what people are actually already doing in this uh, these areas. And so this is, uh, these are all the IS uh, measurements. And so these, this is, I think, about 100 million data points uh, per month. And so that is a bit challenging. And that is why we worked with Microsoft with their new planetary uh, computer. Uh, that's also where we typically run uh, our computation uh, models uh, because that's uh, very suitable for that. And yeah, because what I mentioned that you need a lot of data sets combined, yeah, then it starts to make sense to have all the data together. And Microsoft is one of the um, uh, big tech companies that uh, offer solutions in that uh, direction. And similar to, for example, what we did with Google with their uh, um, Earth engine. That is what we used for the coastal uh, uh, scan around the world. And with Dell, for example, what I mentioned that they had chip shortage, I'm uh, trying to simulate all the waves around the world. And so that is um, really interesting that there's now also technical capabilities that make uh, uh, working with these data sets um, uh, comfortable rather than um, a big hassle. And it also allows you to zoom in and enhance in real uh, detail. So, for example, I already showed you that Anchorage uh, area from the Sentinel-1 satellite, but hey, you can really zoom into it uh, if you uh, use these IES measurements. Uh, or uh, what I mentioned is that you have nourishments along the coast. You can actually uh, zoom into a ship and uh, play um, a video as it's uh, building uh, uh, doing that nourishment work. Hey, you see that it's sailing all the way off, uh, out of the coast and then putting it down here and putting it down here at the same time. Hey, so they might have two ships uh, working, for example. Hey, so that's a really nice that you can also make this into uh, video maps. Hey, that was one of the things I uh, worked on also, um, hey, that you can not only have static maps, but also um, a video on the map. And so here you have some uh, wind turbines. 
Yeah, then um, yeah, you see maintenance being done. Yeah, here, um, here you see these anchorage areas right away, really zoomed in. Here you also see the tidal pattern. Yeah? You see these little arcs, and that um, yeah, the ship is either on one direction or it will change the other direction uh, uh, with the tide. Yeah? Really nice uh, patterns. I'm not quite sure what this is. And um, but here you see all the activity yeah, sailing back and forth to these wind parks to do the um so here a bit zoomed in more on the touristical areas here if you go to amsterdam you can take one of these um, um boats uh, along the channels these low uh, boats and then you can also see these and here you see the here we have a ship across the channel here you see sh ships waiting on certain locations yeah, but it's really and we applied several new techniques also to make it uh, let's say visually visually a bit more uh, appealing so we used um, yeah, sort of like hdr like uh, pattern so that yeah, things really um, light up yeah, so that the whole distribution of low intensity to high intensity sort of equalize this histogram so that you can see both the low intensity patterns, yeah? like here you see the sh two shipping lanes being used, but also here on the most busiest places in Amsterdam, it sort of lights up because that's all where all these uh, um, ships are waiting to uh, take tourists um, to the Anne Frank House and uh, other nice touristic places. Here, here you see the, um, if you look here, here, you see the ferry going back and forth. We're also looking at um, uh, to see if we can, for example, derive current maps uh, from ship IES data. So if a ship, if you can assume that the ship is sailing at a certain constant speed, uh, if you uh, that um, uh, a long ship pattern is a bit difficult, but especially the sideways movement of a ship. Uh, is a really good uh, information source also to get current maps where these are not available and in most places around the world these are not available and here you see these ships moving for uh, for england and um, and so that one was one of the data sets i was uh, working together with uh, solange on here you see all these um, uh, ships um, being taken into the the harbor and so here they're picked up this is the waiting spot and then they're picked up and being turned into this different locations in the Rotterdam Harbor. It's really nice to be able to also use this data so that you can see all the delays happening. And so we want to optimize this uh, harbor because it's quite a competitive uh, business. Uh, and we want to make it the smoothest uh, harbor uh, of the world. And, uh, uh, and so that's uh, really nice to work on to have uh, um, such a concrete uh, goal. Also here you have the uh, muscle, um, uh, muscles, yeah, I think so, F uh, fishing boats also. Here you see that these, uh, this is a very dynamic uh, morphological environment. Here you see the ships taking different channels during different uh, um, patterns in the tide. Hey, here you also see some nourishments here, so here. You see some of the islands being nourished. And so those are some really interesting uh, data sets. Hey, you can, of course, do a lot with it. Hey, so, um, but um, and so to be and one of the challenges I specifically was working on is to be able to do. And so this analysis used to take several uh, uh, several days, and it was uh, difficult to do it at high resolution. But now with uh, Microsoft together, we brought it down to 20 minutes, and we can do it at the highest uh, resolution that we want. And it's uh, 20 minutes later, the whole map is uh, ready. It can also make other maps. For example, this is a uh, lock. And this um, lock, then you're not only interested in where the ships are, but you're also interested in the delays, for example. And so what we do is um, uh, make uh, maps of uh, ship speed, for example. Here they slow down, and here it's a bit lighter. There you see that they speed up, and yeah, obviously. And um, I'll show an animation of that um, a bit later. 
of a, I mean, a real video and that, uh, but to simulate this pattern is for example, ex uh, important for us because well, that lets in uh, salt water, for example. So you want to have it as smooth as possible, but you also want to delay the um, time that ships have to spend there. Uh, here you see the um, uh, energy transmission of energy emission that, uh, yeah, so here you see that uh, if ships are keeping their engine on while they're waiting in the lock, uh, that's actually a, um, a place where they uh, will emit the most. And it's also what's uh, actually happening. And then uh, and, uh, those are some concerns, for example, and that's a question eh? like where do where should we optimize and how much percentage will we get out of this to squeeze out uh, um, all the emissions and so those are i think some really interesting uh, challenges eh? just to name a few names eh? solange uh, that was the main author of this eh? and i helped with uh, uh, to get all this data processing up and running and together with derma we did the visualizations yeah, to, the, to do the color maps and uh, Jessica is a student that also helped out greatly with this uh, challenge and uh, of course uh, Mark also uh, contributed and it was with uh, these uh, institutes yeah, just to um, um, give a proper attribution yeah, so um, maybe a short um, any questions so far No, Phil, I think uh, we, we can continue. Only question from my side, is this uh, available, uh, the Drupe the Drup the, of the North Sea for everybody? Yeah, we are, um, so it's, um, yeah, I think I, uh, if I move this away, yeah, so it's now a demo, so I just showed it to you. It's not publicly available yet, or at least it will be in the next uh, uh, week. So I can already provide a link, but uh, uh, we are, uh, um, sending this out to the press in the next uh, uh, few days. Yeah? So that's, um, uh, yeah, so that uh, uh, please do not uh, share this uh, yet, but um, uh, it will um, at least, um, it will also make a press release out of this, uh, but. Uh, and we uh, still try to make uh, also uh, an English translation maybe. Yeah? Oh yeah, yeah. So we actually made it specifically for the Netherlands because it's such a local topic. Yeah, but if if uh, ever uh, we can probably also uh, translate it, uh, it shouldn't be too hard. Uh, if you uh, that will probably be appreciated. So. Okay. okay. So that's a short overview of the IES data and what we're doing with that. And we're also doing, uh, let's say, a lot of, uh, let's say, pattern recognition to detect sh ships from being moored and not moored and uh, 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 deriving relevant indicators for it. Uh, we're making some dashboards uh, out of this. Uh, so that is, uh, there's a lot of stuff being done there. And also, if you like working on these topics, um, uh, then we're always open to uh, collaborations. Yeah, so just have a quick look behind the scenes. Yeah, so if you, uh, there, this is this um, planetary computer. And then if you, um, for example, make such a map, yeah, what happens in the background is that it actually scales up a lot of computers and makes those uh, available through the planetary computer to your computation. Um, uh, that you send to them and uh, if you then uh, that allows you to combine the data and the algorithms in this case to make these uh, uh, so-called heat maps and that is a really nice uh, uh, technique that's now also uh, uh, publicly available uh, so that is um, a real nice um, technical uh, step that also made this uh, possible and uh, so there's of course um, uh, uh, limitations uh, like i said the data coverage is always an issue. And there you see a big uh, mismatch between the Northern and the Southern hemisphere. And so at least if you look at these uh, IS hub data sets, that is one of the feeds that you could uh, uh, hook into if you also transmit, um, sorry, if you also receive IS uh, data yourself. And so if you buy a receiver and you send it to IS hub, you can also receive the other stations. But if you look, for example, in Argentina, eh, there's only one 
at least in this public, uh, well, sort of half public data set, there's only one station there at the moment. Yeah, so that's, uh, but you might have other um, archives uh, that make it possible. But uh, there, if you want to do something similar, uh, you probably have to look into what a good data source is. Uh, uh, um, and of course, you have other data, uh, also satellite IS, but those are typically less. Um, frequent and so that's and that's typically what you see that you have some sort of uh, spatial mismatch uh, that you don't have uh, if you look for example here very interesting place but at least i don't have any access to uh, uh, ies data there another thing that we uh, typically work on in our simulation models is a data set for a network and so we uh, um, so if you look at all the ways that you could have a ship sail, a bit similar to this mesh free method or something. You might want to have a ship sail uh, freely across the ocean, but then it's a computational a bit hard to uh, uh, to simulate such all these processes. So, so typically what we also do is make a network. And so this is the Dutch network with a, uh, an extent into Germany and a bit in the direction of uh, Switzerland uh, where we worked on the basis for also for the digital twin that I discuss, will discuss later. And such a network is also one of the important data sets that we use both for uh, rivers. Yeah? So river simulations for the water is typically also done in a similar 1D network, but also to the do the logistic simulations. Yeah? You want to have such a network and it's both a spatial network. Yeah? So you can view, view it as a spatial network, but it's also a graph. Yeah? So it's has connections with nodes and edges so that you can also do things like uh, find the route from A to B. And so that's one thing that we worked on um, uh, last year to make such a network for the Netherlands so that we can do a lot of inland shipping uh, uh, simulations. We're also uh, looking into how to scale this up to the world. And that's something, for example, that we didn't uh, cover yet. Eh? So if you want to do similar simulations, uh, like I will discuss later, you want to do them uh, across the world. Eh? Then if you're interested, we're also looking at collaborations uh, to scale this network up, for example. Uh, also, uh, um, we apply this um, uh, a technique of a global, uh, like if you have then all these data sets, you also want to simulate things and they're uh, so some processes are a bit uh, easier than others. Yeah? For example, we now have a global Titan search model where you can have tidal uh, water levels everywhere around the world. But then some examples are a bit harder. Yeah? So for example, the, to be able to detect locks everywhere around the world, that's a bit more difficult. And also waves, yeah? like I mentioned, is also an example. Yeah? So this is a typical global wave model. And we know that all the waves uh, will end up at the coast uh, uh, and will go straight to the coast. But here they're all going in the wrong direction because those wave models, for example, are very uh, coarse. Yeah? So those are not really um, relevant for local scale. Also, our own global, global wave uh, simulations have really coarse pixels. And so that was one of the topics that I'm working on now. And so we have an approach, and so this is typically a grid that we uh, use for tidal Titan search. And so then you zoom in, and use one of these. So this is where Martin Verlaan uh, worked on at Sun and Muis to make uh, the global uh, Titan search model. And so then you can have the water levels really run up to the coast because there you provide more resolution. And for waves, we typically use the more older approach to have nested models. Yeah? So that you have the coarse wave model and they have a more detailed grid and a more detailed grid and maybe even more detailed grid. And then you have waves running up to the coast. Uh, but that's not, yeah, let's say that is a good local solution, but it's not a real good global covering solution. Yeah? So that was one of the examples that I mentioned earlier. Um, where I'm now working on with uh, Dell is that what we are doing is sampling uh, um, bathymetries all around the world. And then we're taking a sample here and a sample here. Yeah, this is Florida. And then all in this, yeah, this yellow area is our area of interest. And then and now we took 15,000 uh, of these samples and 5,000 
examples, uh, schematics ones, and we all fed them into a swan wave model. And now we're um, uh, trying to emulate, yeah, so that's a sort of a circuit model, as people, have, especially our numerical model, people really like that term because circuit, uh, that's a bit like uh, buying that, uh, you really want the real chocolate, but you also have uh, at least in the Netherlands, you have chocolate fantasy, which only has 2% uh, cacao, and that's not really tasteful. Eh? So you really want the real model, eh? but some people also make an emulator for the model, which is not the real thing. Eh? Or uh, Anyway, that was a side uh, point. Yes, but that's yeah, what, uh, so we're now, for example, running all these models, and I just saw some results from my uh, students, and the first results are looking really good, eh, that we can, with a deep learning model, actually on random locations emulate um, emulate waves. And so that's an example of that, uh, trying to get this global coverage, and then you're basically training a neural network uh, on a... Um, on other model sets. So that's also one example of um, a technique how you can break. I will go into more um, yeah, also the simulations that we use in the ports. So, so I briefly discussed now some typical simulations that we um, yeah, do in the yeah, the typical hydrodynamic simulations, are, those are more what's called continuous time simulations. Yeah? Then you have time is continuously running and then for each time step you're doing an update. And the nice thing about doing these logistic simulations is that you can use discrete time yeah? or so-called discrete event uh, simulation. And um, yeah, so normally you have a time step which is uh, uh, constant. Yeah, but uh, yeah, or it might be related to your current condition, for example, yeah, then it might be a bit shorter and a bit uh, uh, lower, but you don't speed up when nothing's happening. And that's what's really nice about uh, the uh, logistical models that we're working on, which I will go into more detail, is that you can really skip through time. Yeah? So if nothing's happening, you will just zoom through the time until something will happen again. And um, yeah, so this is your typical um, hydrodynamic simulation. Then you need to do time steps, uh, a lot of time steps to be able to simulate where the water is going. But if you look, for example, at this uh, process, um, I don't need sound here. Yeah, but this is an example of this lock that I showed earlier. Yeah, so if you look at the discrete event simulation, you now have one event. And a ship comes in and then he stops at the end of the lock. And this is uh, where Floor Bakker, for example, is now working on to simulate this uh, process. It's really interesting. And uh, during my vacation, I stopped by and I made uh, some time lapses. And um, I asked uh, to, if I could stand on this tower to make some videos. And then uh, here you see a second ship come in. And so it has to wait for the first ship to come in. But now it has to, yeah, now it's uh, in there. You see there's a little space left. And then a third ship can come in and it was already waiting there. And then the lock is full. And so in a discrete event simulation, yeah, this would be time step number three. And then if all ships are in, and they of course, if you can also simulate, they'd have to uh, more up, yeah, so they have to attach themselves to the side there. Now the lock can close and they have to wait for the water level to rise. That's actually what takes uh, the longest time. Yeah, this was there. And you see the here that they have their engines turned on. And that's actually, uh, let's say, if you look at the uh, Solange picture, that's one of the, uh, let's say, bigger, at least localized uh, emission spots. And then in a few minutes, the water level will, um, uh, let's see, it's from this side to here. You see the water level will drop, I think. I just have to think right now. Anyway, so now they're uh, done. And now ship one can leave, ship two can leave, and ship three can leave. And that is an example of uh, such a discrete event simulation. And this would be time step number eight. And uh, yeah, so even if it's, I think it's, 
what is it, uh, two minutes or something, and it was sped up 50 times or something. And so th uh, that you don't have to take as many times if, if, uh, as if you have to do in a normal hydrodynamical simulation. And then you can really simulate a lot of uh, shipping uh, uh, traffic um, in, um, without needing to resort to big computation uh, uh, power. And that is also what I'm uh, working on with uh, Mark. I actually started uh, with Mark on this open sales sim to do the complex logistics. Yeah, that would be, for example, uh, put cargo somewhere, um, take cargo somewhere. And, um, yeah, but it's not the actual movement, or at least not the actual movement over a graph, but it's more the logistics uh, challenges. We started on that with Van Oort because we were um, yeah, the new... Um, uh, the offslide dike was being built and there are uh, several layers of ground had to be put on top of each other and some other construction work and that was a whole uh, challenging process eh? so we wanted to optimize that a bit further and that's when we how we started on this um, discrete event simulation and it's now um, the expanded by mark to also have a queuing simulation Yes, uh, and also where we're working on uh, a lot is the open uh, transport network simulation. And that's also the biggest component of our uh, uh, digital twin that I will discuss after the break. And so it's also open source. Yeah, so you can actually go to our uh, TU Delft website and download the code. Uh, and we made a lot of uh, nice notebooks that can help you get started. And also if you want to use it for students, we have now some really nice exercises that we tested on students to see if they can learn this uh, model from um, with real world data and more schematic examples. Built exercises that we uh, uh, this year first tested uh, or tested and really applied with students where they had to uh, have ships still from this location and find good spots at birth and wait in the anchorage area if nothing was available. And students could then uh, simulate this themselves. They would get like tables like this, start sailing, wait at the anchorage, get the spot at the birth, leave the anchorage, start unloading, stop unloading and stop sailing. And this time span, uh, these events uh, uh, as it's called, these are then generated by this uh, computer model. And then you can yeah, not only simulate one ship, but you can also simulate thousands of ships. Yeah, for example, if you want to simulate, um, yeah, do a reconstruction of the Suez event, which is also um, something that you might be interested in. And here you see an example of a student that uh, had the anchorage area all filled up. Yeah? So there were uh, 30 spots in use and here thousand ships went to a different port because there was no space anywhere. Even though the container uh, terminals were not fully uh, occupied. Yeah? So then you might want to check, okay, what's going uh, on there? And these kind of simulations are uh, what's called discrete event simulations. And that is what we use a lot if you uh, zoom at the uh, zoom into the logistic level and also what I want to discuss after the break. Then I'll go into a bit more detail of the digital twin Farweg corridor, or fairway or waterway. And, um, and so, but uh, before that, uh, I think it's good to have a short, uh, short break and maybe some questions already. Uh, yes, Fedor, uh, we have some a, a question for you. Uh, it's coming yeah. from from Victoria. <clears throat> Victoria, would you like to address directly, or shall I transfer to Fedor your question? Hi, uh, I can address it directly. Uh, I. So I work in for sea turtle conservation. I am more on biological science and ecology rather than uh, civil engineering. Uh, I was just wondering if you could actually apply this study to um, a biological study as in, can you actually notice a bi biological signature, for example, for fish groups? and then follow their patterns and relate it to uh, ship pathways and see if there is any impact uh, on fish groups or not. Oh yeah, well, I'd like a sum, um, if, um, if you look, for example, at this squid image based on the light images, yeah, that is a typical example of where 
for certain ship types, for certain fishing fish types, you see very specific patterns. Eh? So there's, uh, we are not actively working on that, but there are some other groups also uh, that are uh, trying to, for example, from IES data, trying to derive uh, patterns of uh, uh, fishing into certain uh, fish types. Okay, so I think they have this global fishing atlas or something, the global fishing watch, I think it's called, okay. uh, yeah. where they use similar approaches, but then specifically for different fish types. And we're also applying the same techniques, but then we're more, um, and let's say interested in are they dredging are they mooring are they uh, waiting for the lock and so we're at the moment uh, and not so much focused on the fishing patterns uh, but i can uh, point you to the specific techniques or publication on that topic that is uh, i think a good starting point uh, uh, for yeah, that for sure. yeah, but the general can, technique can they... of uh, is, is the similar Okay, okay. And can they actually distinguish the different species of fish or like specific well, for, or not? For example, if you look, at least I can see uh, just from uh, looking at it, I know that there are certain uh, patterns now that I can see, okay, this ship is uh, dredging or this ship is sailing for mus uh, fishing for mussels, for example, because they uh, take a very local area and then keep going okay. back and forth. Yeah, so, and that might be something that you could easily train because it needs to be, let's say, um, um, yeah, let's say with a certain depth. Yeah? And uh, and if you take, for example, squid, yeah, there have to be, then yeah, you will, will never find them uh, in a very undeep, at least not the bigger ones, in a very undeep area. So there you need a real deep area. Yeah? So you can use external information also to make a certain pattern be more likely a certain. Uh, fishing type of kind. Okay, thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Feather. Thank you, Victoria. Shall we do a 15 minutes break so everybody can yeah, grab sure. a coffee? Okay, uh, so okay. let's recall in 15 minutes from now. And so the second section that I uh, had prepared was a bit, and so we uh, uh, up to now, I talked mainly about, hey, let's say, our research efforts, yeah, but we also try to apply it uh, uh, in real world um, uh, use cases. Yeah? And uh, that's where we have the so called uh, digital twin uh, uh, waterway or fairway, if you will. Um, yeah, and that's a project uh, from uh, Smartboards and um, uh, DigiShape, sort of consortium about uh, digital transformation in the Netherlands, and um, Witteveen en Bos in uh, TU Delft and uh, at Deltaar. So I'll um, uh, uh, discuss a bit about uh, what we're doing there, a bit about what uh, the concept of a digital twin is, and, um, uh, and so this. Um, and I'll try to make sure that uh, I'll stop in time. So I'll go for, over it a bit faster than the uh, research uh, material that I discussed before the break. And so this is, um, and this is an example of, and so we have the research line where we uh, and work with students and PhDs to build this software. And then we also try to apply it in real world uh, use cases. And, um, and we have like the, the logistic chain in the Netherlands where um, goods are taking further inland from the Rotterdam Harbor. And uh, Smartboards is an organization that works to optimize this process with Vin and Bosse Engineering Company. And NPRC and Dansa are, are um, transport organizations. So they both have ships or have a consortium of uh, ships and they um, uh, transport bulk goods and containers uh, further inland. And we want to help them um, and they challenge us to make this process as smooth as possible. And um, last year we did the first uh, simulation exercises and transformed that in a so-called uh, digital twin. And, um, um, and that's where I tell now a bit about. And so that's a bit, uh, that's very, uh, let's say that's a bit more um, local. And so that's uh, only focused on the Netherlands, uh, on the Rhine uh, uh, River. 
uh, say from Rotterdam to Basel, that uh, corridor. And one of the challenges there is that uh, well, if you have very low water, then you have um, a very limited space. Then you have, uh, let's say, under queue clearance, and then you can't take as much cargo. And it ha actually happened in 2018. It was one of the uh, challenges. We also have like these climate challenges and other scenarios that we're working on this year. But this drought is one of the examples. Eh? So uh, um, here you see this is normally um, wet, but then in 2018 it was a bit. At least it was the first time since a while that it was really um, dry. And uh, in the meantime, all the ships got a lot bigger, and that, um, especially that combination, caused, uh, let's say, a sort of surprise and also some concerns. A bit about the digital twin concept. It's a sort of a buzzword. It's actually uh, uh, often it's just a simulation. Uh, but if you zoom in a bit deeper about what people expect, if you call something a digital twin, then, uh, then it's uh, a sort of a combination of real physics, real data, uh, often a social aspect, uh, important and interactive aspect that you can interact with it. And often uh, we don't have that in this, uh, at least not yet, in this um, uh, version, but we often also make a sort of virtual reality component so that it also looks very real. And so, um, uh, we're working on this with a team. And so, Migena is project leader, Jurian, my river colleague, and uh, Cindy, we work on the web development with, and also with Veen and Bos, uh, Frank worked on it, and Solange, uh, the PhD uh, student that's working on the energy module and the uh, network also with us. And so this the uh, project team and then also the other organizations uh, provide us with a lot of uh, input. And so here we um, uh, basically we're looking at that drought scenario. And that's often how we set up such a simulation that we think, okay, we have sort of like a normal condition. We often have a base scenario, like your typical uh, uh, non-eventful uh, non um, uh, situation and then and often something happens, right? like um, um, some area might not be available, or in this case, a drought, or you know, if you have high water, you can't go below certain ships with certain loads. And so that, those are typically, let's say, events that you want to take into account. And we and do that on a base of scenarios where we combine KPIs with, um, with sort of a storyline with, uh, with um, a decision and that um, yeah, so here we uh, use that network that I showed earlier yeah, so that's based on the um, Dutch waterway network and then uh, we have uh, nodes and uh, segments and now we're looking at this uh, area and here in Neus you have uh, sir, uh, is one of the critical points because there uh, there can be very uh, that's one of the lowest uh, let's say they have the uh, least under queue clearance. And so we first optimized this uh, network and we added a few things like locks, uh, bridges, berths, and uh, yeah, there's also some strange things here, like uh, you can somehow sail in a circle. I didn't look into that in detail, but and then along these uh, edges, we, um, we typically add uh, extra information. And we also used uh, a so-called uh, discharge water depth relation. So that uh, what, what people um, want is to uh, be able to sort of turn the climate knob. Uh, but of course, there's no one climate scenario that uh, affects uh, everything. But here we sort of schematized that, that for each location we uh, computed the, uh, based on observations. Um, where available and otherwise model results, we computed the discharge at a certain location at the edge of the Netherlands. Uh, it was low bit. We computed the discharge water depth relation. And then you can have one knob that um, is sort of representative for the whole uh, water levels across the whole network. A bit simplified, but that's uh, typically what you do. And so that's not the main. Uh, the main interest. And here you have the open T and SIM model that I discussed earlier. And it says the discrete events, yeah, loading, sailing, waiting for lock, unloading, uh, done. And then you have the schematized SIP, yeah, which can have emissions, 
can have a certain speed, has a queue clearance, uh, might uh, not be able to say below a bridge. And we also have things that we're, uh, we do, don't have included uh, all of it. And we're now working on currents, for example, and water levels for the energy. Uh, but we don't, for example, have wind. Yeah? So the ship's not affected by wind at the moment. Yeah? So depending on your application, you might want to add that. And the model is quite flexible that you can add extra formulations or use a different formulation if you need something else. Yeah? So that a vessel has a certain behavior. It has a sailing properties, uh, cargo properties. It might uh, be able to sail slower if it's more loaded. Uh, for example, that's a formulation that you can use, or it might use power, or it might use uh, fuel, depending on um, what type of ship. Uh, so, and all we typically implement it as sort of like lookup tables, uh, so that it's um, or some Python functions that do uh, that kind of work. It's and uh, it's a relatively uh, simple model if you compare it to like real ship. Uh, simulations focused on a single ship and how that's affected by uh, by hydrodynamics. If you might want to look, for example, at the ship, how it's sailing into a lock, hey, you might might use a whole different model than this. And we also have like a ship database um, based on data from different sources. So we have sort of like representative uh, ships that we use and also interesting uh, if you want to apply it somewhere else, yeah, you might be able to use some of this uh, information. And we also make that available as a public data set that's on our uh, Zenodo um, uh, feed. Same for the network, is also a public data set. And um, yeah, what we did is um, yeah, with these um, transport organizations, yeah, we get information from them that was also often in the form of an event log. So on April 8, the ship was in Basel, and on um, um, April 10, it went uh, through Germany in the direction of the uh, Netherlands and then back, I think. No, this is in the direction of the Netherlands. And Basel is at the start. And, that's, and this, this is basically what we want to reproduce. This is sort of our validation data of how a ship really sailed. And then hey, what we have is this uh, Python modules based on SimPy, uh, the model. And you have things that it will uh, wait for a certain event. And that uh, I won't go into that uh, more detail, uh, but um, basically that generates that uh, event log. And so we learn from uh, we learn from event log, we put that into code, and then we can generate a new event log. And so then you get the same thing at the ship gets a task, waits for um, the cargo to be available, and then sails to its destination, and there it can unload. Yeah, that's the typical working cycle. We also included a control tower, where there's an operator that sends certain tasks to a ship. And um, yeah, we have input, yeah, so this is like your typical input for a model it might be a diff bit diff different from your typical hydrodynamic model but still it's uh, like uh, providing a fleet providing sites where there are certain uh, cargo and it might have an unloading rate and a loading rate uh, that it takes time to load the container and that will determine how long it has to spend at the terminal to load its cargo into the ship yeah, and they have ship with properties as i already discussed an operator might have properties have, yeah? for example, how long does it take for an operator to give a task to a certain ship? And they have climate as a condition. Yeah? We have discharge and we now uh, have set up a first version of currents of the whole model. Yeah? That is um, what uh, Jessica, my student, uh, is now working on. And, um, and so and then you basically get output. And then output is also in the form, like I said, of event logs. And here you have uh, like a plan of an operator. It starts, it stops. The operator is sending out tasks to a ship. And then a vessel is waiting for, uh, it starts a cycle, which uh, consists of loading, uh, sailing to its origin destination, loading, and then uh, waiting for a spot and then sail to its destination. And then you can, with just that, you can make scenarios. For example, here we have, 10 
uh, kiloton available in Rotterdam. And then uh, hey, what you can do is send that task to, a, ship, uh, to um, a planner, which sends it to ships. And if you, for example, have one uh, ship, it will take a certain amount of time to load, to sail and to unload. And here you have another vessel that has to wait for vessel A and then load, sail and unload. Here you're a bit zoomed in. Here you have two ships, no climate. And then this is a ISO notation for a duration. So this is 12 days and 23 hours it will take if you have two ships of a certain type for this load. And you have, uh, it takes a bit of time, not much, to send a task. And then here you see the first queue appearing that ship A has to wait, uh, ship B has to wait for ship A to do its loading. And you can also, uh, if you combine it with open, um, uh, CL sim, hey, you might have more cranes, for example, that are working in parallel and can um, do much more detail of that process. But in open TN sim, you can also simplify it uh, that you just have a loading and loading uh, rate. And so you have the uh, ship operator that sends tasks. Then you have a load request. You have in this simulation in open um, in SimPy, uh, the base model, you have um, the concept of resources that you can request. And then you can sail and you can unload if, um, if Basel is available. And so that happens then uh, two times. And here, if you zoom in at the mass flux to the origin destination, you see that ship A is actually working and then ship 2B already arrives when it has to wait and so for it can load before ship A is done. And so that queuing theory, and that's one of the main fortes, uh, strong points for this uh, uh, discrete event simulation. And that's also, uh, let's say, uh, automated if you just um, provide such a function or input. And you see the same thing in Basel, and there it takes a bit longer to unload. Hey, you see your ship A here arriving and it can immediately start unloading, but then ship B arrives a bit after that, but then it is to wait for ship A to be finished. And ship B didn't take as much cargo as ship A, so it's done faster with unloading than ship, uh, ship A. And so here you see, hey, you can make charts like this, hey, that you have cargo at a certain location. And, um, and then after a while, the cargo, is fully loaded at Basel. And so that's the transport open T and SIM simulation that I showed you earlier. Um, and so that uh, zooming back out, uh, then you get like a, a gun chart like this. As it's what planning people typically like to use uh, a chart like this. And so that's not your uh, typical scientific uh, view, but it's more for the planners. And you can also put more cargo with different types of ships with different speeds. And then you get a much more complicated uh, picture, but still uh, the same concept. Uh, you have more ships waiting for each other. Uh, they have um, uh, some ships only have to do one trip, like F, but ship B uh, and A can go from A to B and from B back to A to pick up the next cargo. And then uh, after a while, uh, all cargo is taken. Uh, and then it's faster than uh, if you only take two ships. Uh, and, but here uh, the cargo was also amount of cargo was also increased, and so you have the same queue. Uh, all the ships arrive, and but they all have to wait for each other. So some, and they can compute indicators like waiting time that you expect, or time in queue. Um, and so those are some of the indicators that you can derive then for under a certain scenario. And they can also change the conditions. Eh? So you can change the discharge. And then uh, you might have a very high discharge, or so you low discharge, this is. And then ships can't take as much cargo because they have to pass the lowest point. And then more trips are needed. And then uh, if you change it more, if, uh, if you lower the discharge even more, then even more cargo, is, uh, more trips are needed. And you can, if you do a lot of these simulations, you can actually see if how the discharge is affecting how many days a certain uh, trip uh, needs. And if you then talk with um, a shipping company, they can actually uh, see, okay, well, how sensitive am I really to climate change? Yeah? So here, for example, there's little sensitivity. It will always take 15 days, 
but as soon as you reach the 1300, 1200 uh, discharge level, then it suddenly goes up by threefold. And so then here you have um, um, a real sensitive point where you might want to look at, uh, at different uh, shipping uh, types uh, or different uh, yeah, different ship types, for example, that um, or convoys uh, that you might want to use as smaller ships. And so and we also, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we have a notebook interface for engineers. Um, yeah, so you can open this model and run them for yourself. We have some really nice examples also using that network uh, that I um, uh, explained. So we don't have like a way to apply it all over the world yet. Eh? So we had it still a lot of manual work to set up a network somewhere else. Um, and we also have a command line interface that it's more for uh, if you want to automate uh, yeah, thousands of scenarios. Um, we have a library interface that you can, uh, for example, use open uh, TNSIM or this uh, wrapper around it for the DTV backend, as it's called here. Um, and, uh, you can use that from Python to program uh, with it. We also have a web interface. I think I can show that. Um, do I have that open here? The link is in the presentation. The first time you start it uh, during a day, it's a bit slower to start because the, it's using an old version of the network, which was a bit slow to use. Uh, oh, the map is not showing up. Let me refresh it. Maybe that's because I'm using, ah, yeah, no, it's back. And so here we have this, uh, uh, it is path from um, Rotterdam to Basel. And so you can put the amount of cargo here. And then, uh, well, let's just keep 5,000. You can use one of these uh, vessels. And so here I'll just use, uh, well, let's say three very simple uh, small ships. Then I can change the climate all the way from a very high water level, high discharge level to something uh, uh, normal, uh, and then it takes, uh, since this over to, uh, and so this is not, uh, let's say how you would use it for research, but this is more how we could integrate it into the operational uh, systems. Now it's uh, sending it over. I think it has to load that network, which was a bit slow. And we have now a real fast network. Um, and now it will uh, uh, simulate this. I'm not sure why it's not loading. I think I also have a video of it. But uh, in general, I also put a link so you can try that yourself later. And so this is the same process that I just clicked. And then um, after a while, it will, um, normally it's quite fast actually, it will um, uh, show some results of this uh, visualiz in a visualization. And so that's, um, and then here you see a ship loading and then sailing. And in the outer box, you see that it will uh, uh, load again. And then here you see that event log, but it's, it's more as a demo to show how it could be integrated yeah, because these companies already have like existing, let's say dashboards where uh, this might be integrated into. Okay, and so these are some examples of the, what we did in the first phase. Now we are focusing also in a few European projects, uh, also more in a, to a European network and to have a bit more advanced strategy. Uh, we're doing currents and um, uh, we also um, and might want to do some port comparisons. And also because they are now, what we did now is because the, let's say the emissions are a bit more critical. We move those uh, to the phase now. So now we're doing a lot of climate scenarios. Well, not climate, but I mean emission scenarios this year. And so we have different uh, interfaces like I showed, and we're also looking at uh, making, for example, import export tools to, uh, uh, to be able to import a network for other locations, for example. Okay, well, that hopefully gives an overview of how we really apply this in uh, uh, practice. And um, then I want to give you some room to um, answer some uh, further questions. So 
Uh, let me switch back to you. So I hope that gave you a good overview of uh, yeah, what we are in the, yeah, based on the simula new simulation and data driven research uh, uh, are doing at the moment in um, Delft University and also uh, at uh, Deltares where I'm uh, working. Any questions? Uh, see also the chat. Okay, Feather. first of all, thank you very much for, for sharing the, this nice presentation. I think many of us are overwhelmed by the amount of information you, you gave us uh, and the progress you, you guys are doing over there. It's really, really, really nice. Uh, so let me check uh, again if somebody has questions, if not, uh, well, I think a few are coming, uh, but uh, if not, we will we will have some for you. It's uh, and and some discussion and, and some ideas. Um, first of all, just just to understand at least from from my side, um, for example, the the exercise that you have prepared for the for the students. Mm -hmm. uh, how how long would it take to to acquire and to and to manage those exercises? Because when you were mentioning that, it's something that perhaps we can start trying out to implement in Argentina. Oh yeah, well, I actually did it with uh, Sebastian, uh, who's also here in the audience uh, today. So I think. Uh, if, so what we did is, I think we gave, let's say similar to today, we have, uh, I think, a two hour lecture specifically on simulation, a bit more focused on the details on the, uh, we also have, um, let's say, lecture notes uh, where Mark uh, and others worked on uh, to have a real good basis for, uh, let's say, the theoretical background. And then I think we gave um, an hour or so lecture specifically on setting up the model. Uh, and that, and that took a bit of time uh, also because it was the first uh, time. And so we um, had some in instructions that Sebastian and I made which were uh, sufficient, but uh, uh, might, uh, uh, I think about 80% uh, or something of the students could do it themselves and 20% needed a bit more guidance. And so we did it, and let's say, together with the students. So we had some work uh, sessions of uh, an hour or something where we would help students one on one. And then I think we had spent about, um, let's say, an hour or so per student to check their exercises. We did it manually. And you also have some tools to do that automatically. But we did it um, and we had like a scoreboard uh, that Sebastian and I made for um, to check each student. And so that depends a bit like if you have uh, 10 or 20, that works quite well. But if you would, uh, might have 100 or something, uh, then you might want to do that uh, more automated. There's also tools to do that. But And, that's, uh, and preparing the exercise uh, to make it really local applicable, uh, that actually took me quite a while. Uh, I think I spent several weeks on that at least. Uh, to make a really nice example of the Rotterdam Harbor, even though we already had some uh, some things there. But that was also because it was the, uh, let's say that I don't have a very strong, uh, I don't have a ports background. So for me, I also had to learn a lot about uh, ports concepts uh, myself. Okay. And I think what is maybe also interesting to share about this, Pablo, in addition, is that we, um, uh, we uh, sort of prepared the notebooks in such a way, let's say that students could actually quickly use quite detailed simulations. Eh? So with a connection to, uh, to this network with actually uh, 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 had like a data set of, of vessels and, and actually quite complicated things, but because we prepared these things already in advance and the things that they actually needed to change, they were, let's say, uh, not uh, they did not require super uh, skills in programming and so that's something that you yeah we had to figure a little bit out what what the sweet spot was eh? so the students have some background in python programming so they know how to uh, create a table and to do some multiplication and division and stuff like that eh? but then all the things around it eh? like setting up the simulation model and making that run that was already prepared beforehand and that that way we could 
uh, have an exercise that was quite advanced, but still could be done even with by people who did not have much Python background. Okay, uh, let, let do you have any comments, Sebastian? Let, let me add to that the remark that also that for the people that were not that skilled in, in Python, uh, that bridge was covered by a few videos that Fedor made, uh, uh, going right from, from scratch until, yeah, being able to change some stuff in, in the script. So I think it's uh, totally applicable to any student in Argentina. Yeah, so, so we made some videos also in, indeed on how to install. And I think that there were some sort of prepared scripts on how that, that really prepared, let's say the Python environment that you needed. Yeah? So basically uh, it, we tried to remove as much as, uh, uh, we, we tried to remove a reliability on, on high Python skills as much as possible. So it was a bit of an, of an effort, but in the end, I think it worked quite well. And what is, okay. what is also nice, which, uh, which I like, is that, let's say this was, I think one of the first examples where students actually could work with packages that we developed basically from our research line. So with our PhDs, and that we could then actually in our education line, get students to really work with the, the products from our research line. So that was yeah, quite a nice uh, closing the loop, so to say. No, oh, it's it's extremely interesting, Mark, and of course, congratulations. No, no need to say that, but but it will be really challenging, but also useful if we can follow this up and try to to replicate for a few students at least uh, here the, the, this exercise. Uh, so uh, let, let's talk over the the coming days. Oh, yeah, so just... we set it up all with open packages, and uh, and and I think also the exercise we could probably make open. Huh? So we're we're looking for a way also with our development of our new curriculum to somehow create a repository of exercises of this type. Huh? So we will have more huh? so than just this one, and then maybe we can then make like a directory where yeah people want to experiment with these exercises can go to. So that that should be open. Yeah, it will take us a while also to prepare, but uh, but I, I expect that to be up and running maybe uh, within a year or so. Okay. No, that, that's that's really nice. And are you giving because there's a question uh, from from the audience? Are you giving this formation on on the courses of Ports and Waterways one and two, or only for master thesis? How how is it working? Yeah, so for, for us, uh, ports and waterways are, uh, let's say, master master uh, uh, part of the master track. So it's like, say, of the, the, the students that are nearing the end, eh? so fourth and fifth year students. And let's say this, uh, ports and waterways one also has an exercise, but it doesn't require programming. And then ports and waterways two, that is really for the people who want to specialize also a little bit in it. And there, yeah, we have this uh, this exercise. And uh, uh, so, so they're a bit more experienced uh, students, uh, you could say, uh, but we also use it as, uh, let's say, maybe an, uh, a little bit of a teaser. Uh, so students that like this kind of thing, that uh, they might also be uh, looking for master thesis topics, uh, uh, basically not uh, unsimilar to what Sebastian is doing right now. Okay, okay. Uh, clear, clear. Uh, it is nice. Uh, Raul, you want to, to, to mention something, I think? No, uh, just uh, to congratulate for this advance. Really, uh, is is very important, and uh, we will try to to find uh, someone who can follow Sebastian uh, step, so we can continue the the lead with uh, another another students. We are trying to find find someone who can who want to to continue this connection between uh, uh, the University of Buenos Aires and TU Delta. Uh, very good. It sounds, uh, that sounds really promising. So I'm hoping that you can find, of course, people of similar skill as uh, Sebastian, who is probably a one of a kind. But uh, who knows? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm going. To, I'm going to leave. Huh? <laughs> uh, let's see we, we will look in between the penguins in Patagonia if we can find somebody else uh, like Sebastian uh, uh, but, uh, this, this type of meetings where uh, you can show 
what are you doing and how advanced you are in, in this portal waterway subjects. I, I think that they are very stimulating for young people to try to, to follow this lead. So uh, I really thank you, Mark and Fedor, for this uh, presentation and your collaboration with us. Yeah, you're very welcome. Eh? So we also really enjoy it from our side. So it's uh, really stimulating also for us to share our knowledge. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot for this, uh, this opportunity. Um, uh, that, that's great, Mark. Uh, let's, let's do a final round of check. If somebody else has, has a question uh, from the audience or a comment, uh, I don't know, perhaps Carlos, that your master thesis in Delft uh, many years ago when Ring Grunfeld was in these models regarding capacity and, and the SIM port. Uh, yeah. How do you feel with this new development? Well, it's, uh, it's amazing the progress since the years I, I was there. So, but anyway, um, I was uh, just thinking about uh, to apply at least the, the possibility to let the students here in Argentina or the engineers, the young engineers here in Argentina uh, the, the existence of this kind of tools. And uh, well, we were talking about already a couple of weeks ago with Sebastian and Raul uh, regarding the Master of Science or the, 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 the postgraduate course that the uh, ADIP is, is conducting here in, in Argentina. So just to incorporate this kind of tools to the to the program of the students. So is this would be will be for us very interesting just to to look into your methods just to to progress about so is this. But yeah. anyway, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so what, what we're looking for also is these kind of exercises uh, that we can uh, then offer the students. And we also try to have, let's mm -hmm. say, maybe a little library of exercises, uh, as I was saying, so that yeah. not every year the students get the same exercise, because that also yeah, then will not be very uh, uh, stimulating. So maybe uh, there's also a good opportunity to see if we cannot make uh, an example uh, for an Argentinian yeah. uh, case. And then yeah. uh, we, we will benefit, but you will also uh, have a case that uh, maybe appeals to uh, the local uh, issues. Huh? So that, uh, that could be an interesting yeah, way yeah. forward. Yes, we yeah, agree. Yeah, I, agree. Uh, I, I think uh, we will be in contact in, in the near future about. It. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, you know, Mark and Fedor, that uh, some years ago, let's say 10 years ago, uh, some students for from TU Delft made their uh, master thesis on uh, uh, studies on the Rio de la Plata in Argentina and uh, under the guidance of uh, Ring Rumford. So this, this possibility is also open to find a student, a master thesis student that want to apply, update, these uh, old studies, now old navigation studies. Yeah, that's a good one. So yeah, so we get a regular requests from students and they always uh, like also to have uh, challenging locations to go to. So maybe this will be uh, a good uh, attractor for, uh, for uh, uh, entrepreneurial students who want to go uh, and, uh, and look at a problem in Argentina, who knows? And uh, uh, Pedro showed that uh, there was only one point with AAS data in Argentina, but uh, we have our own network of receiving stations. So from many, many years. So we have plenty of data in that case of, of, uh, of ships, of navigation in the, in the whole waterway. So that can help. It's great. Uh, yeah, Ed, so the, the one point I showed was uh, from a certain uh, sort of uh, central archive from IES Hub uh, that's used, um, uh, and it's a, let's say, public uh, uh, source. Yes, that is uh, the official site. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's just just Fedor and Mark just to, to add on, on top of Raul's comment. Uh, you have a, a few, like I, Raul mentioned, on the whole waterways, quite a lot of data. Uh, also in the port of Vallablanca, there's data related to this. And I think Raul and the team with also the Navy, they have been doing some, some studies in, in Antarctica. So uh, the, the first ones uh, all over the, the world were conducted uh, in Antarctica, in the in the bases, in the Antarctic bases. So the, there's quite some room for cooperation in this sense and to also bring some, some challenging or interesting topics for the students. Because when you mention Antarctica or the Paraná River, I think they will call the attention. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, okay, okay. So, and, and well, also she said, Sibori is with, with us. She's professor uh, on civil engineering where you have the courses of ports and waterways and then uh, she's also a professor at the Ports and Waterways School. So this is more specific. It's like the, the Ports and Waterways too. But if, if you have some, some first guidance or a few slides uh, that can be shared with, with us, maybe she said you can include them in, in the regular courses in, in, in grade. What do you think, she said? Uh, it would be great if it could be done uh, just to, to show the students the importance of uh, all these new things we, we can use hmm, in searching. And uh, I, yesterday I, we were talking, Pablo, and I, I told you that during the presentation, I use some, I copy some slides to show the people just at the same moment, no? Because they are a great, uh, the, the way you show the audience, the things are great. Uh, you, uh, people uh, <clears throat> uh, show uh, more interesting when you see uh, all these interesting things and in this way you show them. So uh, if you can, I, I will take some slides and I will show to, to, the pup to my pupils. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so I think if you look at our uh, new lecture notes uh, that we uh, uh, talked about, uh, all the figures in there have specified underneath it uh, with, with which uh, license they can be reused. And by far the most of them are uh, either public domain or, or like a Creative Commons type license. So you can just use those figures in your teaching as well. I think you only need to uh, attribute where you, came, where you took it from. So if you put that just underneath the picture, you can just use it. And I think also, yeah, if you have some specific things that you, that you were particularly interested in, yeah, just give us a, a, drop us an email or so. So maybe we have even more a, a nice pictures that we can share with you. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's the way I uh, view it. So I don't know what you think of that, Fedor, but uh, we typically try to make everything available uh, to whoever wants it. So we, we have a, as much open source possible mentality uh, as, we can, as we can be. Well, yeah. Thank yeah. You also, much. for the, the, the slides that I used, I think I put everywhere the, if it's not for myself, I put the, the uh, source of the uh, um, other, uh, of the creator. The, and so then it depends, um, and let's say for academic uh, purposes, uh, these did analogy you can always uh, reuse, uh, and that's how do you call it, uh, uh, use information to a certain extent uh, to have. Um, uh, to show it in purposes like this, uh, with attribution, of course. But there's, um, um, and for my own, uh, and for the things that I didn't put any attribution, typically my own there, uh, I, I use the same licenses as uh, Mark with uh, a CC, uh, uh, what is it, CC uh, attribute. Uh, so you yes. can freely uh, use, reuse it. CC by, uh, so then CC you, by, have yeah. To, uh, yeah, you have to attribute and then it's uh, reusable. Yeah, just, uh, if you just put source uh, uh, to Delft, uh, then that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 we will do the referencing. We, we are not creating any complex situation. Just, just right. do not worry. If we use something, we, we will reference to you guys and of course let you know uh, in advance uh, that we are using this information. Uh, the whole purpose, we, purpose. Uh, we try to make everything in such a way that, that the whole point is that other people can also use it. So uh, we really welcome, uh, welcome that.
Yes. Okay. Well, that is that is very important. This uh, this uh, open source is uh, helping the whole port community. So it's very important. So well. If we do not have any any further questions from from the audience, uh, I, I, yeah, okay, we are I proponer. I will okay. propose that the, all people go unmute and bring an applause to a, our a big hand. professor Mark and Feather. Yeah, open open your microphone. Thank you, guys. Uh, it was an amazing week. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, very much for the invitation. Uh, and we really appreciate uh, this and love the cooperation. OK. Uh, and just uh, keep that mind open all the time. If you think we can be useful in, in some sense with information, data, education, uh, whatever we can contribute from these corners of the world, just <laughs> drop a line. Uh, and let us know, and, and we will try our best. Uh, just to, to wrap up, we finished the first week of courses of ports and waterways. Uh, coming week, we keep the cooperation with the coastal structure teams of TU Dalf, uh, Bas Hofland, and Alessandro Antonini. And then on the 27th of October, we have the open seminar for the whole port community, not only in Argentina, but those who are willing to, to join with the keynote speech of Mark um, and also from Bas, Bas Hofland. Uh, that will be interesting to, the registration will be open on October 12th when we finish the courses coming week. And well, we will have some special guests like the Dutch ambassador in Argentina or the president of Pianc International uh, to, to join the, the venue. So, and of course, the Dean of the faculty here of the University of Buenos Aires. So, well, keep that and save the date on your agenda. So, but that's all. Mark, uh, do you want to address the final words or something? No, I'm just, uh, just uh, as I said, uh, very happy for the opportunity. And you said uh, the, the, the lines are open to see if we can have some interaction. And I was really, as I like, thinking of an exercise with an Argentinian case, or maybe looking at, uh, let's say, uh, this Argentinian AIS data and see if we, what comes out if we analyze it, maybe uh, uh, with the, 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 the approaches that Fedor uh, showed, uh, focusing on intensity and velocity and emissions and so on. I think uh, that would be, yeah, I'm already interested. So uh, let's see okay. what we can do. Okay. Okay. Great. Right. Okay. Well, we will. thank you, everybody. Uh, we will come back to you, Mark and Feather, and we are talking soon. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, yes, ciao. Right. ciao, ciao. Many Bye -bye. thanks.